Well, good morning and welcome to Trace. How y'all doing today? Good, good, good. My name is Corey. I'm one of the, uh, the teaching pastors. I got to tell you, I've been looking for an excuse to wear my flannel shirt, and I finally got it today. Anybody else looking for excuses to wear some long sleeves? I saw some scarves earlier. All right, it is officially fall. At least it feels that way out there. I'm so glad you guys are here with us this morning. Uh, as Aaron and I were planning out kind of our, our teaching scope for the year, uh, we thought that with the beginning of a new ministry year and kind of entering into our second year, this would be a great opportunity to do a series called This Is Us, where we give an opportunity for those of you all that have been here for a while to be refreshed, uh, uh, kind of our vision and who we are. But, but for those of you all that are just now joining us, and I know we have a lot of you, uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to kind of hear from the very beginning, like who we are and, and what we're all about. And so uh, today actually is a little bit interesting because uh, a lot of the stuff we're going to be covering in the, in the coming weeks is, is stuff that, that we've already communicated. But today we're actually unveiling some stuff that's brand new. Nobody has actually heard about, all right? So we're going to give you the, the, the inaugural opening of, of these concepts today. And, and so here's, here's what I'm convinced of, guys. I'm convinced that, that people in general, they, they, they are wanting to know more and more about what people do. They, they want to know less and less about like wh- what they stand for or maybe even what they believe. They want to actually see things in action, what they do. Uh, let me give you a, a picture of this. If I was to take you to my, my family back home in Kentucky, I, I could introduce you to them. I could tell you that their name is the Bullocks. I could show you where they live. I could show you our, our family crest. and I could even tell you what we believe. But, but you're not going to have a, a real good picture of who we are as a family just by that information. It, you're going to actually need to hang out with us a little bit. May, maybe observe us, watch us, even experience some of the things that we do in order to understand who we are. And so I, I would encourage you, like, come hang out with us on Christmas Eve and, and stay up to the wee hours of the night playing a heated game of Rook, all right? That's, that's what we do. You know, come watch the, the UK basketball game with us and, and watch us lose our minds over a bad call, all right? That's, that's what we do. You know, come walk our neighborhood with us and watch how my parents uh, know the names of every single neighbor and they stop to, to chat and maybe even help out some of the neighbors. Uh, ride with us on Sunday mornings, every, every Sunday to church. Uh, come throw some football with us in the backyard next to the fire pit. Uh, treat everyone as if you knew them forever. And, and then you might start to get to know our family. Now, I, I believe that that's a correlation uh, to the church. Y- you, see, you see, people... They come here, maybe you are coming here, maybe you've heard about this place, and, and you might be interested in our mission statement. You might be interested in the goal, which I think is an incredible mission, is, is to leave a trace of God's love everywhere we go. But what you really want to know is what do we do? What do we do? And so what we're going to do today is, is Aaron and I are actually going to tag team. We're going to tag team fi- uh, four key traces of things that we do around here. Simply put, this is stuff that we do. Now, now I got to warn you that this morning is going to be kind of like drinking out of a fire hydrant, all right? Uh, we got four new things to cover, and we have two pastors in which to do it, all right? So just prepare to, to you know, just brace yourself because it's going to come at you. We're going to speak really fast. We're going to get as much done as we possibly can, all right? Now, uh, these things you need to understand, we, we've only been here a year as a church. Uh, these things that we're going to introduce to you today are things that we, we have been doing, Okay, um, but, but we have been looking at and mulling over, are, are these things that actually separate us from other ministries in the area? Are these the things that we want to define us when the community looks at us? And so from this day forward, even though we're doing these things already, we want to be known in our community for these four things. So the one thing, the one thing that we want to hold on to today is this. Because of, uh, of who we pursue, this is stuff that we do. All right, because of who we pursue, this is stuff that we do. So key, key trace number one is this. We help families win. I don't know if you all have, have paid much attention to our society, all right? But when you start to look at this, the, the modern family is, is facing some of the greatest challenges that it has ever faced in, in the entirety of its existence of its creation, okay? You look at some of the statistics that are out there. Uh, 60% of, of kids are now growing up in non-traditional homes, which makes that the, the new norm. Uh, the, the issue of pornography is becoming an uh, epidemic within our families, and it's actually affecting kids younger and younger. We're still left to see the, the agonizing results of that. We, we are losing when it comes to our, our kids in, in the spiritual realm. Uh, there are statistics that show that, that 80% of kids that, that kind of graduate out of our home and don't know Jesus by then, 80% of them never will come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. 
In addition to that, we're losing our kids at a staggering rate where they're graduating and they're going off and they're actually starting to classify themselves as nuns. Like no religious affiliation, not being a part of church, not really even pursuing Jesus at all. Maybe even more staggering than that. Okay, And this, is, this one hits close to home because we happen to live in, in, in the, the fifth most desirable city in the nation. Did you know, you know that Colorado Springs is, is represented that way? That's an incredible statistic, right? But we are also the second most suicidal city in the nation. How does that happen? How does that happen? I don't know, but I know this, that now more than ever, the family needs help. And, and we as a church want to help families win. Now I'm going to make a statement. It's kind of a bold statement. Just... Just stay with me for a moment. This is what I would say. Society itself is hanging in the balance of the strength of our families. Now, follow me with this logic for a moment. The home is the basic unit, all right, that makes up neighborhoods. It's, it's the thing that forms churches. It's the things in which communities are fashioned. It's the very thing that I believe that nations are sustained by. The fact of the matter is our nation could crumble. It could fall, and the family unit could still sustain but in contrast, guys, when our families fail, it affects everything else around us. I, I personally think that that's one of the reasons why we're seeing some of the issues that we see in our nation. Guys, I get it. I get it. Marriage is hard. Kids are difficult. In-laws are infuriating. Can I get an amen? Anybody here? All right. And, and, the, and the family unit is becoming more and more confusing and hard to navigate. We, we get this. But that's why we think that one of the things the church must do is, is to actually enter the danger to help families win. Now, I say enter the danger because, let's, let's be honest, okay, families can get ugly, all right? Now, I don't know about your family, but I can tell you, uh, my family can get ugly, all right? I got my little girl sitting in the front row, all right? Um, I, 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 lose, I lose my temper sometimes and I can yell at my kids. Like my, my, my wife and I, we've been to counseling on multiple occasions and marriage coaching. Uh, I mean, we, we've done that, you know. Uh, we, we fight over the silliest things like, like cucumbers, all right. That's a story for another time, all right. But, um, but you know that you fought over stupid things like that. Uh, guys, we have been tempted to give up on trying to resolve these, these situations that, that seem unresolvable. The Bullock family is no different than yours. It's everyone is normal until you get to know them. And then when you get to know them, you realize how screwed up we all are, right? Okay? That is the family. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, is we're calling it out for what it is. We are living in a challenging time. Now, now try to speak into that chaos that I just mentioned. Oh, by the way, throw in some pride and ego and, 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 and self-sustaining, all right? Like we, we are entering into a danger zone. Matter of fact, there's a, there's a bumper sticker um, that you all might have seen uh, that showed up around here in Colorado Springs. Have you all seen this one? Anybody? Focus on your own family, all right? There's another word there, but we have kids present. All right, focus on your own family. Guys, this is an absolutely true statement. The fact is, we should be focusing on our own families. You see, we have to win in our own families if we are ever going to help other people win in theirs. And here's the cool thing, is that by winning in our families, we actually help other families win because we give them something to look at, something to observe, to be able to figure out how they can win in their own family. Guys, I'm not lying when I tell you this. I need this church to help my family win. And then by winning in my own family, guys, if I care about other people, if I care about our community, I care about our nation, we must help other families win too. So uh, let me ask you this, or let me tell you this. How, how, do we, how do we as a church actually help families win? There's, there's several things that we do. I'm just going to you know, rapid fire some of these things. First of all, we believe that families that serve together stay together. Okay? And so we try to provide as many opportunities for families to serve as we possibly can. And, and I can tell you about Ed and Carla and, and their boys that help out in our children's ministry, or Kai and Brian, who, who you might have been welcomed by, that stand out at the front doors, or Rachel and Lisa who head up our, our preschool area, and the list can go on and on and on. We, we encourage our families to serve together because we think it strengthens the bond of the family. Uh, another thing that we do is, is we actually partner with parents. How many parents do we have in the room? All right, good. All right, here's the deal, parents. Y'all ready for this? It is not our job to raise your kids. Can anybody say amen? 
All right, the children's ministry is saying amen back there, okay? It's not our job. It's not our job. It's not our job specifically to, to raise your kids in Christ. That's not our role. Our job is actually to partner with you in that process and to provide resources and help in that time frame. Matter of fact, Moses is speaking to parents when he says these words. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home or when you walk along the road or when you lie down or when you get up. See, he's not talking to priests. He's not talking to the church. He's talking to parents at this point. He says, it is your job. So the church's job then is to come alongside of you and to partner with you by providing different resources and opportunities and avenues to be able to reinforce some of the things that your kids are already learning in your homes. And one of the things that we've uh, kind of instituted here just recently, we're trying to use technology as a tool, this thing called a parent cue. Uh, how many of you guys have already gotten parent cue on your, on your phone? Some of you? A few of you? None of you. Right, this is the first introduction to you guys. Parent cue, okay? Um, and find Daisha. This is a way to kind of reinforce the things that we're teaching your kids on Sunday mornings. Uh, you're able to kind of actually follow along and ask additional questions and even to see the videos that they're seeing. And so make sure you check out uh, uh, Daisha, who's our children's director. She'll tell you more about this. But get this downloaded on your, your phone and use this as a resource. In addition to that, one of the things we do is we offer this thing called D1, which is simply a discipleship tool. We believe that this thing uh, can actually be used um, to, to, uh, in, in, your, in your marriages with your spouses, as well as like with your youngest kids. You read through the chapter, and you get something from God as you're reading the Bible, and you simply share what you're learning with other people. This is a great thing to do around your table. Again, resources to help partner with you as parents. Uh, in addition to that, we invest in your kids through our program. One of the things we said from the very beginning, you'll hear more about this next week, but, but Next Generations is one of our major focuses. Is one of our major focuses. We offer programming for, for kids at birth all the way up through high school, and we do that very intentionally. Uh, we are trying to reach your kids in a way that they're not only going to understand the things that they're learning, they're going to want to come back, and they're going to bring you with them. All right? Many of you guys are here today because your kids have drilled, you, you, you dragged you here today. All right, We know, and that's okay. We're glad that they did that. But, but we are intentional with these conversations that we're having with your kids. So much so that over the course of this past year, we've had 16 of your kids give their lives over to Jesus and get baptized. Guys, that's an incredible thing. Matter of fact, last week, last week we saw baptisms. The majority of them were all students. And this grandfather got a chance to baptize his grandkid. Guys, that is why we exist. That is how we help families win. And one last thing, guys. One last thing that we do is, is we offer counsel. Uh, we're not going to act like we got all the answers or that we got it all figured out. But what we will do is we'll sit and listen because we've been there. We don't act like we've not had difficulties in our marriages or that our, our kids are perfect, all right? Because they're not. Um, we understand what you're going through. And what we want to do is offer you an open door to say, hey, whatever you're going through, let us go through it with you. Let us partner with you. Let us pray with you. Let us offer some additional resources, okay? Guys, I've got to make use of all the money I've spent on my counseling to be able to help you guys, all right? So, so come to us and, and learn some things there. Guys, we do the things that we do because of who we pursue, all right? Because of who we pursue, this is the stuff that we do. All right, key trace number two. We extend hope when life hurts, okay? We extend hope when life hurts. Let's... Let's be honest, guys. Everybody hurts sometimes. Can you just put your arm around somebody right now and just right, just let them know it's, it's, it's going to be okay. I was actually, I was tempted to sing that, that, that little chorus, uh, you know, for you, but I, I decided to spare you the hurt of hearing me sing, okay? So, but no one, no one is immune to pain. No one's immune to pain. And, unfortunately, no one can keep you from it. I, I wish, as a parent, I could keep my kids from pain. I wish, as a pastor, I could, like, eliminate You just come here, no pain. It doesn't happen that way. And because of that, we believe, as a church, that the church itself should be a beacon of light to a hurting world. We, we, should, we should acknowledge the fact that there's pain and there's hurt. And so, when you feel those things, guys, we're a place you can come. We are a place that, that you can come, and instead of avoiding you because of your burden, we actually want to help you carry it. Just like the Apostle Paul said to the church in, in Galatia, he says, carry each other's burdens, and this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. 
And I can tell you that this is the type of church that we are because, like, I've experienced this. My family has actually experienced hope when life has hurt us. You see, you guys, you've helped us carry the burden of mental illness and depression and and other challenges and, and distractions in our life. Over the course of the past year and a half that we've been here, we've endured some things, and you guys have walked alongside of us. You've provided meals, and you've watched our kids, and, and you've, you've offered some encouragement, and, and you've just checked in. And because of that, you were able to offer us a glimpse outside of ourselves and pointing to hope that helps us get through some of the hurt. Now, this is what I can also tell you. You didn't solve our problems. You didn't take them away because the church, the church is not in the business of fixing people. If you came in here today because you wanted to be fixed, understand, guys, we're not in the business of fixing people. That's not what we do. We point people to the one who can fix you. But our job is to be here. It's to be available. It's to be present. It's, It's to be primed to be able to offer hope in the midst of your hurt when it comes because we know that it will come. And the reason why we can do this in the first place is because we can comfort others with the comfort that God himself has offered us. Guys, we are able to extend hope because hope has been extended to us. You see, the very reason why my family is able to help other people when they're hurting is because we have experienced hurt. It's not in spite of the hurt, it's because of the pain. And we found purpose in our pain, and that purpose is this. Especially whenever we see people that are dealing with the same things that we're dealing with, we have the ability to be able to empathize. And extend the same kind of hope to, to them as, as we were extended ourselves. And so this is what you guys need to know. It doesn't matter what you have gone through in your life. It doesn't matter what's currently plaguing you. This is a place and these are a people where you can find hope in the midst of your hurt. Instead of judging a sin struggle, we're going to help you wrestle with it. Instead of dismissing a mental illness, we're going to seek to understand and, and, and offer some help. Instead of letting you sink into isolation, we're going to pursue you so that you don't have to hurt alone. And so when I say that we extend hope when life hurts, this is what I really mean, guys. You have an opportunity to extend hope to the hurting people that are around you. Because of who we pursue, that's Jesus. This is stuff we do. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to shape something, to form something, this church that, that is doing some amazing things, that, that are actually accomplishing some of these key traces. Father, I pray that, that you would continue to elevate our game, allow us to, to know who we are, our identity as a church. Let us focus in on some of these key traces to, to be able to help families win and enter into that danger, as well as to be able to not, not be ashamed of, of entering into the hurt of other people's lives. Father, not to be afraid, because it's scary sometimes. We don't have to have all the answers. Sometimes we just have to be there and point to the one that can offer them hope. Lord, I pray that we would do that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Hey, just when you thought the service should be over, another pastor gets up to give you another sermon. Right? Don't worry, we're not going to take another offering. Like, we're not with that kind of church. But uh, we do have some exciting things to share. I'm glad that we chose to do it this way today. We try to uh, lead here with a sense of creativity, not wanting to be predictable, because we worship a God that's not predictable, right? And we want to think about how we can do things differently sometimes that might be able to get a message through to you that otherwise couldn't. And so I'm going to finish up today. Corey began with giving us key trace number one and two, and I'm going to finish up by giving us key trace number three and four. But let me remind us of our one thing as we get started. Because of who we pursue, this is the kind of stuff that we're going to do. It's as simple as that. Well, one of the things that I've always hoped to do is model my ministry after Jesus. It's it's an important thing when you're a pastor. And I've observed him and read the Gospels, I don't know how many times. And one of the things that I've come to appreciate about him more and more is how he is able to weave incredible stories together. And those stories have a tendency to make a point that leaves people with this idea, with this sense that maybe I need to think about my life differently. But the way that he does this is that he kind of steps back when he's in a particular setting and he makes incredible observations. And then from those observations, he follows those up with even better questions. And then because of whoever is in that particular setting, whoever's in that context, he knows what kind of story to tell 
to get his message through. And that's something that I'm trying to model my ministry around as well. I want to show you of a particular time as we lead up to key trace number three, where Jesus does this. And he does it in Luke chapter 14. If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn there. Um, We're going to begin reading in just a second. But Luke chapter 14, and in this particular setting, Jesus is at a party. And while he's at this party, he's observing what's happening around him. And as he's making his observations, he notices that this this is a time, this is a situation where he needs to speak into where people's hearts are. So I'm going to pick up in Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 7. I'm going to read the first part of this. You won't see it on the screens. I'm going to go fast, uh, and then I will put uh, the second part of this up on the screens for you to follow along. Here's what, he, here's what it says. When Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner or the party were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. When you're invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone more distinguished than you has also been invited? Then the host will come and say, hey, give this person your seat. Then you will be embarrassed and you will have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he will come and say, friend, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. But those who humble themselves will be exalted. And then he turns and he looks at the host. And can we all pretend that we're the host this morning as a church, collectively, as Trace Church? Let's pretend Jesus looks to us in this particular situation and then says this. When, not if, but when you put on a luncheon or a banquet. In other words, when you throw a party, he said, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors. For they will invite you back, and they will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Guys, one of the things that I think we all have in common, because it's a part of human nature, is we all have a tendency to lean towards what is comfortable. For instance, and oftentimes this this has to do and revolves around people. When you walked into church this morning, you probably were looking for somebody that you knew. Right? We all want to kind of lean towards what's comfortable. If we see somebody we know and we can go and we can start a conversation with them, it kind of brings a little bit of peace over us. Anybody remember those awkward like moments walking into the, the lunchroom when you were in junior high? not knowing anyone, right? That still kind of exists inside of us. And so all of us want to lean and move towards what is normal and what makes us comfortable. But this is also why we have a tendency not to hang out with people who don't believe the same things that we believe. Maybe they're not in the same socioeconomic status as us, or they don't have the same interests or hobbies as us. But Jesus says when you throw a party, not when, or I'm sorry, not if, but when, invite those people. Because those are the people that I would throw a party for. Let me share one other time where we see Jesus in the context of a party. You actually see Jesus at a lot of parties. I mean, I think we could say he was a party animal a little bit. I'm not joking. Um, His first miracle was turning water into wine at a banquet of a wedding, a party. But this is not that particular story. This is a different story. It says this, and this is in Matthew, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 5. It says this, Jesus went out. And he saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, also called Matthew, sitting at his tax booth. Now, let me give you some context here because it's important to understand. Tax collectors were like the worst of the worst when it came to sinful people. They were very tied to the Roman government. They cheated people over all the time, manipulated. They stole. They were just horrible people. I guess the equivalent today would be like a Green Bay Packer fan. So, hey, guys, it's okay if you're a Green Bay Packer fan. We need broken people and lost people here that don't know any better. So, it's okay if you're... Oh, gosh, we just lost some people at our church. Um, Jesus says this, follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet, a party for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others, others could have been prostitutes. A lot of scholars believe this would have included prostitutes because they hung out with tax collectors a lot. And others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples. Notice that they didn't complain to Jesus. They weren't brave enough to do that. They complained to to his disciples, and they said, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? My guess is Jesus overheard this because it doesn't say the disciples answered 
the Pharisees. It says that Jesus did. Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy. Can we just slow down for a second? It's not the healthy who need a doctor. Let's contextualize here. It's not the healthy we should be throwing parties for. But the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Friends, don't miss this. When Jesus throws a party, misfits show up. Prostitutes show up. Sinners show up. Friends, key trace number three is this. We're going to throw incredible parties. Now, some of you, I don't know what your church background is, but it's possible you look at this and you say, you're going to make that a value? Like, if you could pick four things, you're going to make throwing incredible parties a value? Yeah, we are. But just wait till you see the kind of parties we throw and who we throw them for. Friends, when we throw parties, we're going to be thinking about people with special needs. The sick, maybe those that are starving, people living in sadness, and yes, even sinners like you and me. We're going to throw incredible parties around here. And I don't have time to get into all the different things that we're planning on doing, but I'll share one that we're planning on right now. Because of what has happened with Hurricane Irma and all the people that are down in the Keys and in the Caribbean area, Uh, that have just been devastated. We're looking at throwing what we're going to call a food packing party in this room. And we're going to move all the chairs and just put a bunch of tables in here. We're partnering with an organization. They'll bring in beans and rice. And we're going to pack a bunch of food. We're going to have a food packing party because we're thinking about people that are starving. We're maybe thinking about people that nobody else might be thinking of right now. Friends, because of who we pursue, this is the kind of stuff that we're going to do. Now, I'm going to get into key trace number four, and I need to, I need to kind of warn you here. Like, we, we don't take ourselves real serious around here, but because of the next topic that I'm going to share with you, I know myself, I get really passionate about this subject. And so it's about to get intense in here. Is that okay? Can everybody handle a little intensity this morning? There's not going to be a lot of uh, jokes or anything in this particular part. But, guys, um, I don't know if there's another subject that I'm more passionate about right now. Let's start with this. Key trace number four. We pursue Jesus in life with grit. I have to be honest, when I shared this with a few people, they were like, Aaron, are you sure that's the way that you want to say it? Like the word grit, that just, it like catches on the tongue. It doesn't, doesn't sound pretty and nice. It doesn't sound like something you put in the lobby of a church. But it's exactly why I wanted to use this word. Best way I can describe this, I love this acronym, GUTS. Resilience, initiative, and tenacity. Why did I want to make this one of our key focuses, our key traces, that we're going to pursue Jesus and life with grit? Here's why. Today, in my attempt to be like Jesus, I've been making observations. And per the observations that I've been making over the last decade, here's what I'm noticing. Too many people today are giving up the fight. The fight of the temptation that's been darkening the doors of your life for a long time. The fight in their marriage to not throw in the towel but continue to pursue things. The fight to be an intentional parent. The fight against an addiction. Whatever that fight may be, there's a moment, there's a notion, there's something that happens in the course of our life at some time where there's something inside of us that begins to stir and it moves us in the direction to say, I think I'm done fighting whether it's fighting the temptation, fighting for your marriage, fighting to be an intentional parent, whatever that fight looks like. And as soon as we decide to give up the fight, something happens on the other end of that. We make a compromise. And I can't say always, but almost always, that compromise will lead you at some point in the future, looking back, thinking to yourself, that's where it began. If I could go back, I wouldn't have stopped fighting. Friends, as we move forward into the future, one of the things that I think I can guarantee is that it's only going to become harder for us to be followers of Jesus. Now, I know everybody in this room right now wouldn't classify yourself as that, as being a follower of Christ. But for those of us who do, if we're going to stand up against popular opinion, and I'm going to talk more about that here in a second, it's going to be harder 
for our kids that are down here in the front row, it's only going to become harder to stand up for what we actually believe in. In other words, it's going to take a fight. It's going to take grit. You see, what's happened in our society, and I think a lot of us, including myself, have succumbed to this, what happens with the uh, path of popular opinion is that so many people have chosen to go this way, and this way oftentimes is away from where God wants them to go or wants us to go. But because so many people keep following that path, it becomes the path of popular opinion, which makes it easy for, easier for us to take that path. I mean, porn, everybody looks at porn. It's not a big deal. I'm just going to throw the, throw the towel in on that temptation and give up the fight. Everybody else is doing it. Friends, there's tons of adversity that's always going to be knocking on the door of our life. And probably one of the biggest mistakes that we've made in the past is that we've tried to overcome this adversity alone. And this morning, my biggest hope is that we'll come out of this conversation understanding it doesn't matter how many towels you've thrown in. Can I be clear about that? I've thrown my fair share of towels in and given up the fight. This morning is about picking the towel back up and getting back in the fight, no matter how many times that you've thrown it in. But this time, and I'm going to say this on purpose, don't be stupid and try to do this alone. God never intended for you to navigate the adversity and the temptations and the addictions and anything else that's coming in our direction. Never intended you for you to navigate that alone. And so when you pick up your towel today, this time let's pursue Jesus in life with grit, but not alone. One of the things that I do with my team every Monday is I take them over right around the corner here to a place called D1. And it's a place where you can work out, high intensity training center. And some of you guys know I used to be a personal trainer. And I don't take them over there because I want them all to have washboard abs, uh, even though that'd be pretty awesome. But that's not why I take them over there. Listen to me. I take them over there and take them through a really hard workout. And it's really hard for me to, not as young as I once was. But I do that so that we can push together that we can work hard together, that we can put obstacles in front of us that takes each other helping one another and encouraging one another to overcome whatever obstacle that is and to push through something that is difficult. And in the process, we learn grit. That's the only reason. That's the impetus of why I take us over there on Mondays to go through this workout so that we can learn what it looks like as a team to overcome something that's difficult. And I truly believe it's probably one of the better things that we do as a team in developing the skills that will be necessary to overcome the adversity that's coming in our direction to the, to the direction of what we're trying to accomplish at this church. There's adversity coming our direction. I have no doubt about that. I love uh, what was said not, long, not too long ago. Time Magazine put out this article. It was called 10 Things That All the Greatest Leaders Have in Common. Number three on that list was this. They were tough in a crisis. Number three, the greatest leaders of the world. Top 10 things that they had in common. Number three, they were tough in a crisis. In other words, they had grit. See, Jesus talks about this too. He talks about how we're going to, it's one of the promises he actually makes us. In this life, you will have trouble. In this life, you're going to have a crisis. You might have many of them. Many of you have already experienced your fair share of trouble in this life. Many of you have probably already experienced your fair share of throwing in the towel at times. And Jesus uh, specifically explains this type of crisis as a storm. The storms that are coming in our direction, the storms that are coming in our life. Let me read to you exactly the way that he says it in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24. It's on the other end of the Sermon on the Mount, what many scholars would say was the best sermon that Jesus ever gave. And he concludes this sermon by saying this. Listen, listen, listen. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. In other, wor- in other words, the storms came because it had its foundation. It didn't fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. The storms came. 
and it fell with a great crash. Can we make this current really quick? I want us to think about all the people that are in Texas right now, all the people that are in Florida right now that just navigated a hurricane. And if you were asked them, man, what did it take to navigate the biggest hurricane, Hurricane Irma, that the Atlantic has ever seen, the, the largest hurricane, they would say it takes grit. But it also takes each other. You see, to navigate big storms in our life, God never intended for us to do that alone. He intended for us to do that with one another. Just like these people would tell you in a very practical and tangible way, you don't navigate storms by yourself. You do so with a community of people. And if you've been watching the news at all, you've probably seen story after story, incredible stories of people coming together to help one another and to offer hope, as Corey said, or to offer hope when life hurts. And through that process, they would tell you, man, in order to navigate storms like Hurricane Irma, in order to navigate the storms of our life, it's going to take grit. Friends, I don't know how many towels you've thrown in. Maybe you have thrown your towel in on your marriage. Maybe you've thrown your towel in on that addiction and said, who cares, everybody's doing it. Maybe you have thrown your towel in, you fill in the blank. The beauty of Jesus is that no no matter how many times you've thrown it in, he's ready to give it back to you. And he's he's trying to tell you this get back in the fight. I don't need you to look in your rearview mirror and think about all the times you've thrown in your your towel. I can strengthen you from those particular situations if you allow me to, but what I want you to know is from this point moving forward, it's time to pursue me and this life with grit because adversity is coming your way. But this time, and I don't think Jesus would say this, so let me just say this myself. This time, don't be stupid. This is the kind of talks I have to have with myself. This time, pick up your towel, get back in the fight, start fighting for the things that God has made clear that we need to be fighting for, but this time, don't do it alone. Corey shared that verse with us just a few minutes ago in Galatians. And we've got to carry our burdens together. And in this way, we actually fulfill the law of Christ. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to give us an action step about what it looks like to pick our towel back up. Before I do, I want to pray. And then I'll close our time together with giving you this action step. Let me pray right now for us. God, sometimes when we have these conversations, uh, we leave here, man, feeling guilty because we know the the towels we've thrown in. We know how many times we've thrown them in. Some of us right now, maybe in this room, are, are currently throwing towels in and we're giving up the fight. Father, would you remind us of the power of the cross, the power of Jesus and his resurrected body? That power lives in us and so to... To get back in the fight is actually our choice. It has nothing to do with whether or not you want us to. That's clear. You want us to get back in the fight, to pick up our towel, and start pursuing you with grit. Ready to overcome adversity, but this time not doing it by ourselves. Understanding that the enemy has always wanted us to attempt life in isolation. That's one of the best places he can find us. But no, this time we're actually going to do it together. So Father, would you show us what it looks like to pick up our towel and get back in the fight today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, I told you.